On May 7, 1949, Henry Hap Arnold became the first and only officer to achieve the rank of General of the Air Force. Arnold overcame an early fear of flying while training with other aviation pioneers, the Wright brothers, and became one of the first rated pilots in the United States military, overseeing the expansion of the air services during World War I under the tutelage of Billy Mitchell. In general, the United States Air Force shall include aviation air forces, both combat and service, not otherwise assigned. It shall be organized, trained, and equipped primarily for prompt and sustained offensive and defensive air operations. The Air Force shall be responsible for the preparation of the Air Forces necessary for the effective prosecution of war, except as otherwise assigned and in accordance with integrated joint mobilization plans for the expansion of the peacetime components of the Air Force to meet the needs of war. After World War II, it was apparent from issues arising from the Joint Command of the Aviation Branch that the Air Force required autonomy if it was to develop into a useful arm of the United States military. Disputes between Hap Arnold and theater commanders over maneuvers and procedures that later proved beneficial to the American war effort took presidential intervention to override and implement Arnold's winning strategies. From then on, the United States Air Force was its own distinguished branch of the U.S. military. Enlisting as a private in the Army Air Forces, Chuck Yeager quickly enrolled in the pilot training program, coming out of World War II as a flight officer and fighter pilot aboard a P-51 Mustang. After the war, Yeager continued to serve in the AAF and later the newly formed Air Force as a test pilot. On October 14, 1947, piloting the experimental Bell aircraft X-1, Chuck Yeager became the first pilot to break the sound barrier, flying at a speed of Mach 1 at an altitude of 45,000 feet. While his record was later broken by test pilots exceeding Mach 1 and 2, Yeager quickly re-established himself by being the first pilot to reach speeds in excess of Mach 2.44. Ever loyal to his country and his men, Yeager's sense of duty helped to usher in new advances in aerial technology. We didn't know if we could break the sound barrier, but it was our duty to try. That's the way I looked at it. As the Yalta Conference guaranteed no rail or road transport of goods or services into the Allied occupied sections of Berlin after World War II, the Soviets effectively blockaded these avenues of import for goods and supplies. General Lucius D. Clay, who oversaw operations on the U.S. section of Germany, consulted with General Curtis LeMay, commander of the United States Air Forces in Europe, in an effort to subvert the blockade. Clay reportedly asked LeMay, can you haul coal? To which LeMay responded indignantly, we can haul anything. Because of provisions in writing that there would be three 20 mile wide air corridors providing free access to Berlin, the Soviets could not claim any aircraft carrying only basic needs and supplies to be a military threat like that of the tanks, trains, and trucks that would have rolled in via land. By the spring of 1949, it was estimated that an aircraft reached the Allied section of Berlin every 30 seconds, supplying more cargo than previously would have been delivered by land. In an effort to contain what the United Nations saw as the beginning of a domino effect of communist rule, the organization known as the UN officially condemned the North Korean invasion of South Korea on June 25, 1950. Two days later, President Harry Truman ordered naval and the newly independent Air Force into South Korea to help that nation's defense. By this time, what history came to call the Cold War was already underway. Rumored nuclear development and armament 
by Soviet and other Axis powers had the United States preparing and training its soldiers for nuclear war. In addition to the advances in weaponry, aircraft innovation saw that the Korean War was the first war that saw the use of jet aircraft in combat. Indeed, by the end of the Korean War, piston and propeller-driven aircraft had been all but retired. New additions to the Air Force fleets included fighters, such as the F-82 Twin Mustang, developed during World War II. The last piston-engine aircraft to be produced by the United States demonstrated superior night combat capabilities. The Lockheed F-80C Shooting Star was the aircraft involved in the first jet versus jet air battle on November 8, 1950. The aircraft shot down a MiG-15, a jet aircraft developed by the Soviets and used most famously by the Koreans during this war. However, the MiG later proved to be the superior aircraft. The real star of the jet fighters in Korea was the F-86 Sabre, with a victory ratio of 10 to 1, shooting down over 700 MiG-15s. Though still unprepared for war in the Pacific, the United States Air Force effectively helped to transport troops, supplies, and equipment from Japan to Korea, and held the North Korean armies back, while the UN constructed a stable defensive base of operations on the peninsula. Four airmen received the Medal of Honor in the Korean War, and all of them sacrificed their life for the effort. If we die, we want people to accept it. We are in a risky business, and we hope that if anything happens to us, it will not delay the program. The conquest of space is worth the risk of life. In 1958, Gus Grissom was one of 110 military test pilots who was sent a telegram. The communique requested his presence in Washington, D.C., in civilian clothes, and told him these instructions were top secret. Grissom had served in the United States Air Force in Korea, as well as the Army Air Forces in World War II. Grissom went on to become not only the second American in space, but the first American to enter space for a second trip. He was part of the Mercury and Gemini programs and was tragically killed during a test launch of the Apollo 1 spacecraft. He was awarded the Congressional Space Medal of Honor, shared with only 27 other outstanding individuals. Exploration is wired into our brains. If we can see the horizon, we want to know what's beyond. Another Korean War Air Force ace to enter the space program was Edwin Eugene Buzz Aldrin, Jr. Aldrin flew 66 combat missions in F-86 Sabre aircraft, shooting down two MiG-15s. In 1963, Aldrin earned his Doctor of Science degree in astronautics at MIT. Later that year, he was chosen as part of the third group of NASA astronauts, and under Commander Neil Armstrong, became the second man to ever walk on the surface of the moon. In 1953, President Dwight D. Eisenhower was being transported in Air Force Flight 8610 when the aircraft entered the space of Eastern Airlines Commercial Flight 8610. The incident only resulted in minor confusion among a few air traffic controllers, but brought to light the need for any presidential aircraft to have its own unique call sign. In 1959, the first official flight of Air Force One occurred. The designation is simply that, a designation. It refers to any aircraft carrying the President of the United States. Currently, two specifically configured Boeing aircraft serve as Air Force One. The double-wide jetliners are equipped with sleeping quarters, conference rooms, and both secure and unsecure telephone and telecommunication lines should the president have to conduct any business while in the air or during a national emergency. 
After the success of the Berlin Airlift, General Curtis LeMay returned to the United States to lead the Strategic Air Command, the operation in charge of America's land-based strategic bomber aircraft and land-based intercontinental ballistic missile strategic nuclear arsenal. The unit was founded in 1946, but when LeMay arrived two years later, he found that the unit was little more than a collection of World War II surplus B-26 bombers. Over the next 10 years, LeMay transformed the unit into an ever-ready machine, implementing tests of 24-hour bomber and tanker alerts, keeping some bomber forces ready at all times. Most importantly to the United States and the world at the time, LeMay advocated not only preventative, but preemptive nuclear strikes in certain scenarios, even going as far as suggesting that a nuclear war be conducted by delivering the nuclear arsenal in a single overwhelming blow.